It's time for Getting Down to Business with Mark Mondo. This new show discusses trends, technology, and tactics to help the listener learn more about improving sales, saving money, and fulfilling a personal mission through entrepreneurship. On today's show, we'll interview a new Chicago performing group, the Campos Collective, who've created a new performing style on YouTube. We'll ask them how, when, where, and why this group was started. But first, a word from our underwriter. Welcome to Getting Down to Business with Mark Mondo on WVLP 103.1 FM. I'm your host, Mark Mondo. We're on the air in Valparaiso, Indiana, and you can listen to us streaming on the website at wvlp.org or use the TuneIn app on your mobile device and look for WVLP. 103.1 103.1 FM WVLP is a local nonprofit radio station based in Valparaiso, Indiana. This show, like many of the shows on WVLP, are made possible by the generosity of donors and underwriters. We accept donations at WVLP.org. Simply click on the support tab and make a one-time donation or sustain pledge to WVLP. All donations are tax deductible. Underwriters are made up of businesses and organizations that support the shows on WVLP. Getting down to business with Mark Mondo would like to thank Homes by Hortensia, a Coldwell Banker affiliate in Porter County, Indiana, for their support. Homes by Hortensia has served the region's residential real estate needs in Indiana for over 12 years. Contact Hortensia Moreno or Tiffany Zorio at 219-249-5118 or visit homesbyhortensia.com. Homes by Hortensia, habla espanol. Welcome to the show. In case you're a new listener, here's my backstory and I'm sticking to it. I've been a consultant for small businesses for the last 25 years, helping small businesses implement customer relationship management software, AKA a CRM system, where I learn their business processes and customize the software to help them gain an advantage in sales, marketing, or customer service. But there is much more to becoming a success in business than just having a good CRM. That's why I bring on guests to tell their stories and share tips on technology, tactics, or trends they employ to become successful. So let's get into it and introduce everyone here today. To one side is my producer. She's a star soprano and she's my wife. Let's introduce Mrs. Cynthia Zimmerman. Hello, hello. And to my other side is the Campos Collective. They are a group of Chicago native musicians and close friends who are passionate about creating their interpretation of well-known music through film, theatrical enactment, and design. The idea for the Campos Collective YouTube channel began when the singers were in college and made private audio covers of their favorite Disney music to share with family and friends. Since then, they have been able to create a full sound and film studio to let their creative spirits run wild. The founding members have trained in both classical voice and theater. Founding members Nikolek Nazarowski and Lindsay Metcher both have master's degrees in vocal performance. Founding member and studio director Eric Campos studied at the NYU at NYU in the Lee Strasberg Theater and Film Institute where he became well-educated in audiovisual recording. So he can fix stuff that I mess up here. The group showcases different genres, such as choral music, musical theater, pop music, and even songs from movies and video games that inspire them. Their work involves creating unique arrangements of well-known classics and cultivating a visually exciting style through the use of film. Each member contributes distinct skills to the studio and they actively collaborate with many Chicago musicians of diverse musical backgrounds. Having just started their channel in 2023, the group has already amassed 80,000 views on YouTube and more than 350 subscribers. Their music was recently featured on the Howard Stern wrap-up show. They have received feedback from supporters such read feedback from supporters such as absolutely phenomenal. This is ethereal and magical. And one of my favorite channels now. So you can find them sharing new videos every Friday on their YouTube channel, The Campos Collective. Welcome. So welcome to the Campus 
Campos Collective. If you would like to say hello, we want people to know that you're real. That oh, we just hi. Didn't make you yes, up. <laughs> hi, I'm Nicolette. I'm Eric. And I'm Lindsay. It's nice to nice to be here. Thank you for having us. You're mm-hmm. welcome. You were the um, highly recommended to Mark and I by previous guests on the show, Luis Galvez, who I for- formed with for many years, and he introduced me to Nicolette. So that is the connection here. And because performers like you provide a different perspective on making a successful career from what my husband's upbringing has been, I'll let him share why he was interested in having you on the show. Oh, my perspectives are very different from everybody else here. My family had a couple of businesses, including landscaping, snow plowing, cable television installations at the city level in the 80s. We also ran a computer-aided design service bureau, a print shop up to the mid-2000s, and they finally divested into commercial real estate, and that's where they are today. Music of the arts never fell into the equation, so that's why I find interviewing colleagues from Cynthia's performing arts realm always interesting and insightful when discussing entrepreneurship. So let's punch right into this. Why have... Why do we invite the collective? You know, can musicians really be entrepreneurs? What does it mean to be an artist today versus the 30s or the Sinatra era, or maybe even before the age of streaming or the age when was it Netscape? It was that guy that stole all the music and did it on streaming servers um, in the 90s. And I can't remember his name right now. So we'll get to that later. So we're going to get into that. And I want to talk about things like, why did you create this collective? And we're going to discuss things like networking and auditioning for employment. So let's go into it. Um, I don't want I, I, as you can tell, I am not an artist. I am the non-artist in this room. (laughs) Why did you come up with this collective? Yeah, I think you touched on some really good stuff there because one of the, one of the things I think really for artists today, that's super important is technology and understanding the technology that's available to create your art because everyone has a non-stop constantly evolving media source in the palm of their hands all day long Uh, and uh, to answer your question as to what's different now as to before the answer is that the the level of consumer technology has risen so much just in the past 10, 15 years. I mean, even when I was starting in college, we didn't have the the same access to the tools that we have now to be able to do the things that we want. So, uh, you know, we obviously record music, which involves a lot of have you know, microphone equipment, uh, editing equipment. Uh, I have a whole soundboard that you can't see, but is on here and we're all using right now. And, uh, all of that would have been prohibitively expensive any you know time period before now so now i think that artists are way more in control of how they can get their their piece out there we all have had different journeys artistically but i think one thing we all share is when you're out there and auditioning and and doing things and working when we all do you're not always doing the things you really want you're doing what people are going to pay you for and this was our way of kind of saying well this is what i want to do and together if we all put our heads together we can make that happen on our channel so we can really get the things that we want to out there and i'll let my colleagues speak to the stuff that they want to be putting out there but for me, it was really important to be able to kind of record things, put it on tape, really have a visual aspect to musicianship because I'm so enamored by that kind of art style. And out there when I'm working, I get to work on commercials and uh, things like that where I don't really have a lot of artistic say. So that's my reason. So is that, as they say, commercials pay the bills kind yeah. of thing? One soundbite that I remember listening to an interview from Kate Mulgrew, uh, a longtime actress in the Star Trek series is where she's most famous, and Orange is the New Black. 
And mm. she stated in the interview that theater was the art, TV paid the bills. Yep. That's great. Yeah. My knowledge ends there at that soundbite. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, I think they, Nicolette and Lindsay and Eric can agree with me that we learn our art form thinking that that is where we're going to be able to hopefully, if we work hard enough, do a hundred percent of the time as our career. But we all kind of know leaving the uh, the wonderful, nurturing, supportive environment of the music school or the film school that um, we not only have to pay our dues, but widen our expanse of what being successful in our career path is because we can't just do one thing. And I think my experience, I focus too much on one thing and was not able to make a go of it full time. I can do it part time, but not full time. And when I started out, the industry was just starting to work with technology and music as a, of a form, but it wasn't as integrated as it is now. It is not as accepted as it was now. So that's why I'm excited to hear, like, where did all your creative juices come together? Did you guys meet in school? And how did you come to decide we're going to put something on YouTube? Yeah. So <clears throat> it's actually a funny story. So Eric went to NYU for college, and he's always um, kind of worked with film and sound. And one of our favorite things to do, we're theater kids, theater and music kids, choir and, and performing arts through high school. We met in high school. And we always just wanted to record the songs that we want to sing, which were Broadway duets, big group numbers, Disney music. Just, we thought it was really fun. And so anytime I would go and visit him in New York, he had his sound equipment there in his apartment. And we would film these silly little duets or, you know, big group numbers, Bell from Beauty and the Beast, rings a bell to me. And it had just the two of us singing multiple voices. And we thought it was so interesting how you could layer all of those in and get all of these different characters. And um, it really stemmed from that. That was the whole idea. We made all these recordings that were just audio recordings, you know, no video yet, just audio recordings that I would go home and I would show my parents and my friends and they'd be like, we're just listening to you guys sing this cover. So once we got, once Eric had graduated and moved to Chicago, we um, decided we were going to finally do something with these recordings. And my good friend from college, Lindsay, who's a fantastic singer, weighed in and we all decided that we wanted to do this thing where we sing it started with like our old recordings we wanted to finally put our old recordings to video so could, people could be excited and actually watch it um and it ended up just going further and further and now we create new music every week so yeah that was the original concept new music every week New music every week. So um, this is hard enough to do one podcast every week, and I'm just talking. <laughs> so, it's it's tiresome, but every Friday we do we put out a new video, and a lot of it is um, covers of songs. Some of it still is, you know, it's the songs that we want to do. So covers of Div Disney songs or Lord of the Rings choral pieces or pop duets, just the music that we want to do. But we do it every week, and Eric actually does all of the editing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a heavy lift well i know because mark does all the editing for our show so <laughs> there you go so hopefully when y'all hear this in the edit it sounds perfect and that was my my <laughs> it's time consuming though editing it does it does take a while and when you're putting things out every week as you know it's it's a quick turnaround yes yes well how do you find the responses are i mean i'm pretty impressed at how many people have viewed your videos and you've got like 350 subscribers and how, how do you build on that? Uh, did you really like advertise it or did it come out more just like just kind of grew on its own? They, they advertise more than me. I'm not great at that. <laughs> <laughs> it was so, a the hashtag, you know, hashtag Disney on the description. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting. You do have to put a lot of hashtags and, 
so you can get your material out there. But I, we, we share it on all platforms. So YouTube is our home base, we like to say. And mm -hmm. that's where the videos get uploaded every week. So there's the YouTube long videos, the full videos, and then there's the YouTube shorts, which are a one minute or shorter clips of the videos that we make because that's popular now are the shorts and the reels. You see those on TikTok. But we also post on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok. So we just kind of have it all out, all platforms, but we want everybody com to come back to the YouTube page to watch the full video and subscribe there. Are you using tools like uh, Soho Social or uh, Hootsuite to try to take that media and move it to multiple platforms simultaneously? No, they do it by hand. No, we do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we should. Oh. That's a fantastic idea. I mean, there's definitely tools we could use to like optimize it, but we kind of just have our like manually like uploading to TikTok, Instagram, Facebook reels. And it's kind of like a pipeline that all goes yeah. back to YouTube, you know, it started, it really did start out as just something and it still is just something we enjoy. We didn't really care about subscribers at all. And so it, it shows in how we share our. <laughs> yeah. Our music. I wanted to ask that not only for myself, but the audience in general, how are you going to manage that social media? It, 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 what do you do? It's hard. It, it's, <laughs> yeah. hard. It's, I think it's you a, just have to keep going with it. You know, you just have to keep sharing. Uh, One thing that I find um, really helps is not only posting the videos on different platforms, but also posting a couple days before, get ready for this video, or we have something good, we're working on a project to get people excited and to keep their attention. Um, because people these days have very short attention spans when it comes to, like Eric was saying, with social media and everything is very quick, quick happen now. And so you want to keep people's attention. So I find that those short videos are helpful, having people stay tuned. I think I even posted one today that was like, stay tuned. We have something coming out this week or yep. <laughs> something like that. Also, behind the scenes footage, which we recently started doing. We have our first video, which is behind the scenes with Compost Collective, and that's the three of us. We sit down and we talk about um, the work behind the project. So you see the the video, the music come out. It's just like a, a three minute video of a, a song that you like. But we really wanted to showcase the all of the work that gets put in behind the scenes when it even the editing, just the the little mistakes that we make, how long it takes the ideas for the music that we pick, all of that. So that's something that people were actually pretty interested to see. Any bloopers? Tons of bloopers. We have so many. We really <laughs> should put more in. Yeah. Yeah, there, here, there's an idea. I think I actually saw that one behind the scenes that it was really quite, quite enjoyable to watch. And it made yeah. me then want to watch, of course, one of your finished products. Mm -hmm. Have you, I'm curious because I know a lot of the stuff that you're performing like especially the Walt Disney music, did you have to pay licensing for that? Our stuff isn't monetized on YouTube or anything like that. So okay. they, they let it fly. Oh, um, okay. But if we were trying to try to collect it, I'm sure they would come and knocking. Oh, well, yeah. Disney, yeah. Disney but police. They, yeah. Yeah. But they do put up. like a... Yeah, we have had some that get taken down in some countries, which is funny. Yeah, but they do put up like a flag, like when you're uploading the video to YouTube, it'll say like, oh, there's copyrighted content, but the the owner has allowed like you to use it, but you just can't monetize that video. Well, that's that's yeah. good to know, because that's, that's something that I remember way back when I would be doing concerts. We always had to be careful if we were going to be doing a fundraiser or anything that we weren't using anything that wasn't already public domain. Mm -hmm. So um Oh, that's interesting to know. They've, yeah, they figured out that that's just free marketing for them. So yeah, <laughs> yes, true, <laughs> true. You know, oh, don't... is it auto reading the the wave file and going, oh, this is a Disney tune, or is it because of the hashtags you're putting in? No, they're pretty good. Even if you just upload audio without any tagging or anything like that, they're pretty good at at catching. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yes, because yeah. there, there have been some pieces that we do that are choral pieces that are completely a cappella, and we'll still get. Just the melody of us just singing the melody, no backtrack, no anything will still get flagged. Yes. But we're not monetizing, so 
It Good. doesn't. We're <laughs> again for fun. <laughs> I mean, not good that you can't get paid for it, but I'm glad you're right. not going to get sued. Yes, that's important. <laughs> yes, that's the number one goal. Don't get sued. <laughs> Don't get sued. <laughs> have you, uh, as a result of this platform, have you gotten any interest for live performances or any networking opportunities from starting this uh, this show on YouTube? What we've gotten is just a lot of a lot more interest in what with the things that we've already been doing because people love our stuff. Uh, obviously, you know, there was little things like with this Howard Stern podcast that they were doing little things where people were just saying, this is interesting, you know, and I think it's it's barely really picking up that people are are seeing the things that we're doing and uh, seeing the results of that. But like I said, it, it's for it's for us to kind of explore this uh this artistic side of us that we don't really get to exercise a ton you know i like i said did some commercial work um uh, and they are really active musically in churches and especially christmas time i, I know is a really busy time for them because they're they're gigging a lot but i like that you made that a verb Gigging? Yeah. yeah that's, <laughs> that's a, a verb. verb. That's a common verb. I think. Well, there's a gig economy, so I think... Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. all about the gig, you know? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> um, yeah. But we have gotten a lot of people have reached out saying that they want to... They Oh, they say, oh, we wish... I wish I could do this. I want to do it. I'm like, well, well, join us. Come do it. And so we have had guests that way and collaborated with other musicians in Chicago and not... And, you know, for the Howard Stern thing, again, on the wrap up show, we had um, somebody reach out, my cousin reach out and say, you would be great. Can you can you submit this clip? You know, as word travels, um, people get more interested and they they want to do the same things that we're doing and we're happy to collaborate with them. That's wonderful. I'm just how did Howard Stern get to know about you? Was that? So my cousin, my cousin works for the the wrap up show. He's a, I believe he's a writer for the wrap up show. And so um, they do like this, it's called Mama Ma Mondays. Mm -hmm. And I guess they showcase different talent. I had no, I didn't really know prior to this, but they showcase different talent every Monday. And he just said, can you do this real quick? And he gave, there was like a four day turn around. <laughs> we were like, yeah, sure. And so it was us singing uh, the hallelujah chorus, but instead of hallelujah, it was mama Monday. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like eight cute. bars of that. Yeah. It fun. But it was really fun. And they did. And they, you know, they said, check them out on YouTube a couple times. And that kind of stuff really helps. Yeah. I think having Howard Stern following your, you know, giving you a little uh, shout out is. They did say that we were A1 material. Yes. Yeah. They yeah. said we were A1 material, which I had to look up because I. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently it's excellent yes 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 so you're probably <laughs> too young to remember the a1 steak sauce yeah. no yeah, i don't remember a1 no. steak. you do I know it, it kind of comes to... off of that you know it's oh. the first letter of the alphabet and one is first so a1 it's like the best or number oh. one so that's a that's a great compliment to get kudos to you guys thank you, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so Looking forward, in addition to doing this, has it has it inspired you to want to do other forms of performing that you could, I don't know, produce a brand with or expand this in a way? We've talked about doing, um, every time we record a piece, we're like, could we do this one live? Is this something if people ask us to do live, can we do this? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time, there are pieces that we could modify to do live, but some of the pieces, there's three of us primarily. We have guests and another friend of ours works um, pretty closely with us. But there are pieces that are four-part choral pieces. And Eric and I <laughs> will always split the tenor part. So Lindsay will primarily be soprano. I'll sing alto. Eric will be bass. And then we have, we need a tenor. We're missing a tenor. And so we'll we'll chop up bits or one of us will do half the tenor part. If it's too low, then he'll do the tenor part. And so there are some pieces like that where it would be where they're layered or, you know, there's more voices than there are people. Those are the things we would have to modify. But we are always thinking in the back of our heads, can this be something that we do live? 
And we did perform actually um, just a silly little at my brother's Halloween party. They asked, he asked us if we could do a couple pieces for Halloween. And so we did, um, we had to make modified versions of a couple of our pieces and we sang them live. Nice. Yeah. Fun. That's yeah. very fun. <laughs> yeah, definitely performing live is something that would be very fun to go back to because it's not something I've done in a long time besides these uh, little gigs. But also just as I get more comfortable and familiar with the style of recording for, you know, Instagram or TikTok or things like that. And I see creators who are just endlessly creative on some of these socially, social media platforms is so, so impressive. I, I would love to do more video work, even outside of purely music. Um, so that's definitely something that, that I am thinking about. And I do have a lot of kind of film, film or TV friends that I could loop into stuff like that because we can do it just a matter just a matter of time what are you Lindsay well my background was mainly in like classical voice and opera so all of my training was very like rigid like oh you sing a certain amount a certain type of character for your voice type and so it was very restrictive and it was always like okay you you're, you can do this this and that and that's it and once I started working on these videos with Eric and Nikki, it was very inspiring for me because of the freedom to choose what you want to sing um, without restriction. So like about two weeks ago, we did a cover of The Prayer made famous by Celine Dion and Andrea Bocelli. And that was really fun because we just got really creative with the video and it just inspired me to think more outside the box as an artist, like, what do I like to do? Like, I would like to get more experience in acting. Like our project for, we did the Cell Block Tango, which features monologues for the characters. And that was a challenge for me because I just didn't have that much experience doing, you know, monologues. Well, so. you also did your, your monologue was in a different language. So to be fair, <laughs> one of them was in English and the other was in Hungarian. So well, I, that's right. Cause that is that one well. character. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that was fun. Um, I, I love learning languages and like exploring, you know, stuff like that about language and culture. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I think I'm, I'm definitely more interested in learning more about acting techniques as well as you know, expanding my repertoire of singing in different foreign languages as well. So yeah, it's been, it's been really fun and very inspiring. Well, I, I think I can definitely appreciate that coming from a similar background as you, Lindsay, where it's a very traditional performing of opera and classical music, and it's more making sure you can sing it your most, your with a hundred percent accuracy and beauty. And then when you get into more f flexible platforms like the Campos Collective, where you can manipulate the voice and it's not cheating, it's just using different techniques to produce really interesting sounds and uh, performances. And that is, I think, really freeing for classically trained singers because we have the, we have the ability to do that and we can open up from that and kind of fly out and experiment. Uh, but though I, for a while, had a very hard time thinking of, of pursuing that because I thought, you know, I am a classically trained singer. I shouldn't rely on a microphone. I shouldn't rely on any kind of technical help at all because that's cheating. But what you guys yeah. doing isn't cheating because you have the raw talent to do that, to be in the studio, it's not about auto-tuning, you know, your, <laughs> your yeah. performance. It's not that at all. So I, I just, I find it very fascinating and in an, I really enjoy listening to you guys experiment. Uh, what, how do you feel about it coming from like, you know, traditional staged productions or performing, um, compared to this? Do you like one more than the other or just they're both equally or how do you feel about that and where it might be going in the future? 
Before we get into the next segment, we wanted to let you know you're listening to Getting Down to Business with Mark Mondo on WVLP 103.1 FM, a community radio station out of Valparaiso, Indiana. Thanks for listening, and let's continue. It's funny you mentioned auto tuning because we just were talking about it. It's a conversation that people are having on TikTok right now of, you know, what's okay to auto tune and what's not. And we don't. We should. We should. <laughs> Sometimes maybe is a little more auto tuning. Yeah. But we don't a ton. But I think it's because we all are, we're, you know, trained to be live performers and we like that, that live kind of sound. It mm-hmm. sounds odd sometimes when you're, yeah. Sometimes we'll use it if we, if we mess up a note and we're too lazy to go back and re record it. I'm like, Eric, can't you just fix that? Just change it. And it'll sound kind of <laughs> funny. So, yeah. But yeah. fix it in post. Fix it in <laughs> post. Exactly. <laughs> but coming from, to answer your question, coming from a, a live stage versus this, I think they're, they're, they both have their strengths and weaknesses. This is the, there's something you get the rush of having a live performance of having the audience physically there. That's a, that's unmatched. Um, and having done many productions, all of us, I think that we could probably all agree that that's, that's a definitely a, di- a different kind of excitement than it is to film and upload um audio video film and upload these songs which is just equally as exciting but you have to wait until it's published and then then where are the likes you got to sit there at your phone right and just where's my likes where's <laughs> yeah my likes? right right <laughs> not yet maybe we'll get to that point sometimes my- i'm like it's funny because some of the songs that we do are, we think that they're going to do really well and we work really hard at them and we're like, this one's going to be great. And then it'll get nothing. <laughs> so, yeah, definitely. You never know. Like, for me, like what I miss about like live theater is you really get to feed off of the audience's reaction and you have that energy in the room to work with. So it helps, you know, that we're working as a group because we can kind of like, you know, hype each other up. Um, and stuff like that. But as far as like live performing, you get that like instant feedback from the audience and you can play off that energy, which is what you don't exactly get that in a studio environment, but it's, it's like a different type of excitement. Like, like Nicolette was saying. Yeah. Well, I know this is what my husband would call a passion project. And, and I know you don't make any money off of this, but you're still artists. How do you support yourself on a day-to-day basis as performers? So I'd like to say, sorry, (laughs) I'd like to say we all have our real people jobs Mm -hmm. um, outside of the arts, but to speak for myself in terms of performing, I have a regular church job um, and I also teach private voice, which is which I really like. And then different gigs throughout the throughout seasons, you know, Christmas, Easter are big, but um and then there are a couple of small companies, small opera companies that I do monthly monthly gigs with. What are those opera companies? Can you so, say them? Yeah, so um, North Shore Opera Hour for one, which Cynthia is part of as well, founding member Cynthia, and also <laughs> Opera Interalia. Those are the two main Wonderful. And how about you, Lindsay? Yeah. So I would say in the past like six years after I graduated from grad school, I sort of decided to step a bit away from performing for a bit. I still would sing in church and would take some gigs here and there, but I decided to go to coding boot camp and become a software developer so that I could have, you know, the freedom to take on whatever gigs or opportunities I wanted to on the side. So that's kind of the the path I chose to take. But in the past year or so, I've been trying to get back into it on the side. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been great being a part of the Compost Collective because it really brought me back into um, the performing side of things, which is like a huge passion for me. So, um, yeah, I, I couldn't see, you know, my life without singing or, or performing. But you could see it without writing another program in Java. <laughs> I could, yeah. <laughs> I could do a coding junk in there. I know enough to be. 
<laughs> what about yeah. you, Eric? You say you work in commercials. Is that your full-time job outside of this project? No, definitely not. So I worked as a voice actor for many years now, and it does bring in some money, which I'm grateful for, but definitely not enough to, you know, sustain a life or, or, or pay mm -hmm. my mortgage. Definitely. So I, like Lindsay, uh, went to kind of the tech world, but it, I went a different route. I got my project management certificate. I got a job as a project manager at a software company, which is great. And Lindsay and I both work remote. Nikki works remote part of the week. So that really helps in us being able to get together and work on our pieces and all of that. I think for our generation, work-life balance has become a, something that we focus on a lot. And this is part of it. We need it. We needed jobs that will allow us the freedom to kind of do this because I can't imagine doing this uh, channel and putting up a video every week after having commuted, you know, an hour or two each way. Yeah, even the days that I even the days that I am commuting, I'm pretty pretty tired after. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, it's, it's I gotta it's go downtown. I I have to say I I'm I'm happy to hear that for your generation, because I know that was not something my generation was allowed, really. I mean, there wasn't the technology to work right. remotely, but there really weren't a lot of avenues through which you could work and had that kind of flexibility if you had to go for an audition or if you had a mm -hmm. daytime rehearsal. And so it was kind of an either or uh, situation. So in that sense, you know, I've always found technology interesting. I as an older performer like you have to have performing music in my life it's very important but having technology be able to work from home has given me more time to you know pursue other interests like this podcast that mark and i are doing in addition to just learning how to perform in a studio situation when our everybody was closed down for covid and our wonderful choir director, Richard Clement at Christ Church in Winnetka, had to figure out how to continue to have rehearsals and how we continue to record. So I learned a whole new skill set that way. So I'm always fascinated how music performing connects with technology. In another life, I would have loved to have been a voiceover actor. Um, and I love doing things with voice. So it's just, I'm happy to hear that you you found something that works, that gives you that life work balance, because that's very important. And the way that I used to work is not a healthy way. So I'm glad you guys aren't doing that. <laughs> that kind yeah. of segues into, I think, a serious generational shift. Now, every story produced after 2020 talks about 2020. COVID and well, I'm, I'm going to talk about Cynthia here, of course. So I, my company's introduction, I started in the late nineties and my mentor was working from home in like the late nineties. He had a cell phone and a laptop and this was ISDN slash dial up era for, for mm -hmm. younger people here. So he was, it was remote, but it, you know, it was still a little Tough to you didn't do it. You really do computer coding. You just worked on your laptop to you know manage your database. But then, how does that? When Cynthia, you when the COVID shutdown happened, you got a taste of working from home. Yeah, I thought I would never really do well working at home. Uh, I thought I needed that office environment, you know. But the commuting was what was getting to me. It was that time getting to and from work and the stress of traffic and, and, you know, having to leave the office by a certain time to get to a rehearsal it was just all very stressful. And so it took me a while to get used to working from home and setting a schedule. I'm still not really great at shutting off the office at a certain time, but I do like the idea of not spending a lot of time in traffic, getting to and from work. And so, yeah, we were shut down like everybody else in 2020 and I worked from home for two and a half years, and now I only go in once a week or maybe twice a week, and the rest of the time I'm working from home. And I really like it. <laughs> I I really, yeah, really like it, you know, but it was an adjustment. And what I liked about the whole experience, and I want you to share your COVID story and your experience was to 
learning how to use technology to my advantage in both music and non-music environments. That was, was really nice. I don't have much of, I don't have much of COVID story. I work in the medical fields. So we were in full swing then, and now I'm in medical education. So we're still mostly in person, but it's admin side. But for, like you were saying, I did, uh, I worked for a church in Evanston and we went remote. And so we used, we uploaded and the director was, is big on big pieces, big choral pieces. So he did all the editing and that was kind of my first experience. That was pre Compost Collective and where we started filming and we would record our parts individually and then he would put it all together and then they would post it for the congregation. And so that was my experience. Yeah, that is a good uh, kind of skill you're kind of forced into yeah. uh, as a result of COVID. My life changed a lot because of COVID. I, before COVID, I lived in New York uh, and I was working as a voice actor uh, and uh, auditioning a ton. And you would go in and go into a, a studio and there'd be an engineer and a, you know, producer maybe, and they would, you know, give you guidance and you'd go through it with them a few times. And after COVID, there's no more of that, really. There's still to some extent, but then everything was was remote. Send your send your takes from home. And it forced me to one, upgrade my equipment a little bit. Um, uh, because obviously, uh, an, an, an unwelcome result of that, I would say, is now as a as a performer, you know, as a voice actor, as a musician, even as an actor, you're kind of expected to do these things. Even my friends who are who are film and TV actors, they have to have, you know, a nice camera, a nice setup, a space in their house to be able to do their auditions from and be able to send it from there because you're just not doing it in person very much anymore. But the thrill and the love of New York really comes from being there and being out and about. And uh, when COVID happened, that kind of stopped happening. And I said, I kind of had to take stock and realize that I wasn't really happy there. So I said, what am I doing? I wanted to be a place where I could afford something nicer than my old apartment in Jersey. And uh, I ended up deciding to move back home for a bit with my parents who were very nice to take me back in as I was approaching my thirties. And because of that, I was able to save up. I bought a house, ended up making an entire room into a studio space where I could do the things that, that I want to do. And I think if COVID hadn't have happened, I would maybe still be over there and not doing this. And uh, in that way, it changed my life for the better, but <laughs> definitely it was, it was kind of the fire under me that, that forced me into better, into a better situation. Well, those are the successful COVID stories we want to hear. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Luckily we've, we haven't had interviewed anybody in a restaurant or food service or hospital. Oh, no. No. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I don't have any real connections. Uh, no, but know. we know of people that unfortunately have, have suffered and, not come out on the other end uh, mm -hmm. in those industries. Uh, but what about you, Lindsay? Yeah. So in January of 2020 is when I started coding boot camp. So I was there like Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., 12 hours a day. It was very stressful. Mm -hmm. It was a four month boot camp from January to April. And then in March, we basically had to shut down. And then we went, you know, we all went home and we just finished everything out at home. And the transition was, you know, rough because it was very stressful at the time. We didn't know what was going on. It was very, it was a very scary time for everyone. Um, but yeah, I was able to finish it out. And then ever since then, all of my jobs have been fully remote. So I still had my church job at the time. So since I had my fully remote job and you couldn't go anywhere in Chicago or really do anything, I was like, I'm just going to take a road trip, you know? And so I went to North Carolina and I stayed near like the Smoky Mountains for two months. So 
I would just be working from home, like <laughs> on my back porch, like looking out by the mountains. And then at some point, like I would send for my church choir, we did the same thing, like where we would video record ourselves and then our director would splice them together. So at one point I, um, I made a recording like on this hiking trail, like by a waterfall and they were like, wow, that's so cool. So it was fun just like experimenting with, you know, um, the medium of video and, and audio recording at the time. And then when I came back here, yeah, I wanted to continue doing artistic work. So it was great to get together with, with these guys and, you know, make it happen because it's a lot more fun when you do it as a group and it's a lot more motivating and inspiring. So it's been, it's been a cool process. Well, now that you like being in a group. Yeah. Thank you for segueing into the next question on my agenda. <laughs> all right. Uh, <laughs> now that you, I, y'all have to have a, as they call it, would you call it a real person job? Yeah. A real yeah. person job. How do you see this, the future of this group going? I mean, not all of us get to be who those YouTube people like Jake Paul or whoever that guy is who does all the pranks. I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> There's some oh, names out there. Yeah, I don't know them. Not my generation, but you know, I, I assume that's one in a zillion you know, people hitting that full time, full time status. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, I want us to to keep going and keep growing our kind of musical skills. One of the things that we're so excited about in this next year is working with more artists, having more kind of guests, as we call them. Instrumentalists. Come on, yeah, instrumentalists, uh, different kinds of musicians to to kind of expand the the work that we do and, and really get a, a wide variety of uh, styles because that's that's where we have the most fun. I think that'll also build our connections. You know, the more the more people we work with, the more networking we're able to do. Somebody, you know, somebody. It's just all part of the performing arts business. Um, so that's that's also my hope. Um, I also would love to do something live eventually. I think that would be fun. Yeah, like for me, like when we when we started, you know, we would do our audio recordings and then we'd kind of just stand in front of the mic with our music stand and we'd kind of just read from the music. And then slowly we evolved to bringing more acting into it and and more like video effects, just just adding more quality to the recording. So I think we'll just continue heading in that direction. And then eventually we would like to do more original arrangements, maybe add our own lyrics to like popular songs, just maybe make our own like stamp on like um, some of our favorite music and then maybe even, you know, make some of our own like original pieces. And like Nikki was saying, we would love to do, you know, live performances. So I think we're we're going to put together just a list of songs that we'd be ready to perform, you know, at the drop of a hat. So if someone, if the opportunity knocks, that we could be ready for that. And I think that might bring more uh, attention to the channel as well, if we have a live audience. Yeah, we've gone from recording in front of a microphone to a full-on, like, late 80s music video. <laughs> so. the, the technology's there. I mean, we're using awesome technology. Eric, it sounds like you've got quite an investment, but it's affordable versus mm -hmm. 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. I was in the an elite, you know, the video against the Avid in the early 90s, a full NLE workstation, probably comparing to either an Avid Media Composer or probably a Final Cut Pro, I think is still in the Apple world. Mm -hmm. That was just that was just coming in when I was leaving the industry. Those workstations in 93, when my mentor put the best stuff together were 50 grand in 30 years ago. So that was probably today, probably a buck 20 to $200,000, I think. And I'm applying for inflation and the cost of technology. And I'm doing kind of a seat, seat, of, a seat of the moment calculation because though the equipment comparable wasn't even available today. So now that's good. Now I can set up a YouTube account for free. TikTok is free to enter in distribution is now democratized, technology is democratized. So I foresee the next challenge, and it is in my company, and it's totally you know, the polar opposite. 
how do you get promoted? How are you going to get found? And how are you get how are y'all going to get new connections and new gigs and more Howard Stern like endorsements? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, Cynthia touched on something a little earlier that I think is it has been a big boon for us and something that we're going to kind of put more into in the future. And that's what people really are into these days is is really getting to know kind of your personal story. And as soon as we put out that kind of behind the scenes where it was just us talking, us, you know, goofing around, us kind of showing the the human part of it, people were way more interested in seeing stuff like that. I think if, as a part of social media, we're just so used to getting glimpses into other people's lives that when we do find something that we like, we get really invested in things that they do. So I think that's a huge part of marketing yourself in this day and age. Yeah. I think that's very true. That wasn't definitely, um, I, I liked it reference to, for me, it was all about the image, you know, and you had to, you have this polish finish image, right? You never show how the sausage is being made, so to speak. <laughs> you never, you know, showed that it was a, just an old man behind the curtain in the Wizard of Oz. Those are things you were never going to show. And today that's part of the fascination is how's it made? How do you do that? You know, and I, I think that definitely brings a human element to it, a human story element that people can really uh, latch on to and enjoy it even more. It's just, for me, it's still getting used to that because, um, uh, you know, when they ask to have our pictures for this, the radio station is like, they have to have our picture? Why? You know, because <laughs> um, it's, it's still like, oh, people are going to see me, you know, and, and but uh, it's also being comfortable being somewhat exposed. Um, on social media, because that can be both, that's a two-edged sword. But I think what, for what you're doing, there should be no worry at all about yeah. that. Um, yeah, so. I think you're you're right. I think what people like seeing is your vulnerability, right? Like seeing mm -hmm. how they can relate and connect with you. And if you're not showing, you know, your personality, your struggles, your story, your background, it's hard for people to relate and make that connection with you. But, but like Eric was saying, when we, when we have these sort of behind the scenes videos, I think it really helps draw in a personal connection with our audience, you know, because they're more invested in our journey um, mm -hmm. as artists and, and as people. Well, I'm going to get it. Go ahead. I was going to say that being said, um, have you received any negative posts or responses to your YouTube channel or TikTok or anything like that. And just in general, as performing artists, a lot of times we are hard on our sleeve. What kind of emotional support do you have network to, to help you? Because it's not easy being a performer or working in the arts on many levels, because we are in many ways, very emotional people. And so how do you handle that, the negativity that might come out from that? Well, we're thankful we haven't had too many yeah. negative, if any, yeah. I think. <laughs> I think there was like that, one or two. And we're just like, what is this? Kind yeah. of like, <laughs> kind of like, you know, that's like, not bad. Okay. Yeah. There weren't anything like majorly no. like, you guys yeah. are bad. I think one of them had said that we were pitching and I was like, they're right. Yeah. 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 What? I mean, that was true. As, as coming from like already artists and perform performers that performed live and growing up in that environment with high school performing arts colleges we're just so used to critique yeah, <laughs> yeah that that's true. i think that though and who knows it could come in masses and maybe it will affect us more but i think that we're just so used to it that it doesn't nothing nothing is totally unseen like um yeah yeah i think I, that we're expecting it I, one day i'm sure if we grow yeah. that we'll expect more of it but it doesn't bother us for the most part yeah i it, think we're I all kind of our it. own like worst critics so like, yes. at the end of the day we're like hmm, we're always thinking about how can we improve or make like yes. one thing better but like we're gonna have to expect that yes there'll probably be some negative comments but you know that's but not we're not gonna let us right. it stop <laughs> we're not gonna let it stop us you know we're just gonna keep going because the only way to get better is you know, to keep going, you got to go through it, exactly. you know, to get to the other side, you can't like skip over anything. You just got to go through it. And you, there's going to be obviously learning, learning curves and, 
you know, when we try new things, like we might mess up or whatever, you know, but that's the journey, you know, you got to be willing to make mistakes and, you know, fall down a few times before you, you know, make it to the to the end of the finish line, right? Yeah. I remember when I used to perform regularly, uh, I would feel more upset if I didn't have any notes from the director after performance than mm -hmm. when I did, because then I thought, well, was I that on a, you know, didn't impress them enough to even get a note yeah, or, like they don't you care. know, yeah. Yeah. yeah, they don't care. So I think for us, maybe, you know, negative comments aren't as detrimental as they might be to some people who are just not used to that kind of feedback all the time. Well, that's a good point. Well, I have one small question. I, I know it gets a little into the boring details, but if you're new and just trying to get in the performing arts and, you know, you got all these part-time gigs and you're trying to put together with the gig economy, how are performers or freelancers paying for, you know, daily living expenses, you know, health insurance? In the old days, it was always, hey, we got to get, you got to have a full-time job for that. How are you paying for the expenses of becoming an artist? It's not, even though your voice is portable, it's not free. Oh, that's a that's a challenging question, but there are there's like the healthcare marketplace. So if you truly are like completely self employed, you can go through the marketplace and find insurance. Like, and I think you, I think they'll charge you based on like your income level. If you're below a certain level, you are eligible for like Medicaid stuff like that. Um, but yeah, being completely self employed is is obviously very challenging. So I mean, there are options. Um, but yeah, I think really when you're when you're starting out in the beginning, you're going to need, you know, your day job or your, you know, real person job to get to get you going. You know what I mean? Unless you have like a benefactor who's funding your your arts endeavors or something. I'm still looking for one. If you hear of one, let me know. <laughs> yeah, we're, we heard all these rumors about the patron, like having a patron, you know, in the 1800s. Or whatever. <laughs> it's. No, I think it's really tough. I mean, I, you know, from an IT background, I wound up using the ACA, I guess it's called the healthcare marketplace, otherwise known as Obamacare. Yeah. Before that, I was screwed. I mean, luckily I was young and healthy, but, yeah. or I think I was on a yeah, previous life person's insurance before I met Cynthia. I was on that for a while. But yeah, if you're on your own and you have health and don't have health insurance and you get sick, you're cut, you know, our, my unsolicited advice to the audience, get something. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, as, the, as our guests have said, you can get subsidies through the ACA. And that was not available to me until 2010. I took it up on the first year. Mm -hmm. okay. So now that we we're almost to the end of the hour here. So I got one last question or actually, Cynthia, you have to dish out this question. Oh, okay. My pearl of wisdom question that we usually ask any of our guests what they would advise on someone who's coming into their field of expertise. So a young musician right out of graduate school, maybe they've done an apprenticeship program or something, but what would your advice be to them knowing what you know now and uh, the field as it is? Yeah, I would say, I think never has there been kind of a wider gap between how things have been and how they are now. Mm -hmm. And so I think you really have to advocate for yourself and know what you want to do and be able to put a plan into action to make it happen. Because in the past you could have, you know, mentors and, and people guiding you and, you know, people who are kind of actively working, but the way that, that it was then is not the way that it is now. And I doubt it'll ever go back to that again. So you have to be willing to do something different and, and jump, you know, when, uh, when you have an idea that, that you think is going to work that you believe in, you just have to go for it. Even, even if no one's done it before, because that's, that's how people are finding success now. I would say just one other thing is all about connections. That's something that I learned out after school, unfortunately, um, everything that I've gotten, every gig that I've gotten is because somebody knows somebody. So introduce yourself to everybody. That's my little piece of advice. 
Yes, I love that. Um, definitely agree with what both these guys said. Um, networking is super important. Every single job I've ever gotten has come from networking. I could say that with like a hundred percent certainty. I would say when you're when you're in school, really think about the business side of things because you know art it can't be just pure art, you know what I mean? Unless you really just want to do it as a passion project. But if you want to be an artist or a musician as a career, you know, you're going to need to figure out how to make that happen. So I would say really learning about business, maybe even getting like a minor or a second major in, in business or something in the business field, you know, because I really had no idea like how to do any of that. And it wasn't until I got, you know, my regular person job, like in like the tech industry, you really see how like a business runs and you can apply that like to your own entrepreneurship, which was very eye opening to me. So I would say don't neglect that side of the equation. Just really kind of have a plan or maybe find like a mentor or someone who's walked that path that you can ask for advice. Perfect. So we're reaching the end of the hour. I'd like to thank Cynthia for keeping us on the level and on time today. You're welcome as usual. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank <laughs> Eric Campos, Lindy Mesher, and Nicolette Nazarowski of the Campos Collective for coming on the show today and sharing their journey and insight as entrepreneur artists in the challenging business of the performing arts. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. If you missed some of the show today, you can listen to the replay on Thursday at 1 p.m. Central Time on WVLP 103.1 FM or live stream at www.wvlp.org. And we store the past shows on Mark's website at www.mondocrm.com forward slash podcast. Or you can listen to the podcast on your favorite app at any time. Just search for Mark Mondo and the show will come up and you can subscribe to this show for the latest updates and the show is now on youtube just search for mondo crm or getting down to business with mark mondo and the episodes will come up on the youtube feed thank you very much for spending time with us today and we look forward to you joining us again next week <laughs>